So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Redux and NGRX, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about forms, but more importantly, start looking at um, how we deal with side effects in uh, Redux architecture. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about Redux. This is not like a Redux 101, kind of assume that you have a basic understanding of, of the architecture and the pieces and how it works. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, at a high level, some of the patterns. Um, so we've covered this before, and I think one of the, the topics that tends to be uh, a bit more abstract and difficult to deal with is this idea of side effects. So you know, if we look at at the high level um, architecture, you know, we've got our the, the pieces I think that we're pretty familiar with, right? We've got a store, which is our authoritative source of uh, the application state. And then we have uh, a component that is a container component or a smart component, um, you know, whatever you decide to call it, it's, it's the component that is aware of application state. So it's listening to changes in the store. It's selecting slices of state um, you know, from, our, from our object. Uh, it's also the piece that is responsible for initiating changes to the store and the state via, via actions. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an entity that is, is dispatching um, and you know we're uh, the the data is flowing in one direction. Right? This is the benefit of Redux, right? It simplifies our architecture because we understand how the state changes. It's predictable. It's testable. Our reducers are pure functions, right? So whatever uh, inputs we uh, put into them, we can test for the expected output, et cetera. Very testable, very predictable. It's very nice. Um, you know, it's sort of this like promised land of being able to understand a complex app and have, you know, a very complex hierarchy of components, often with um, subtrees that may share the same application state, but they're not necessarily directly related or they're related you know, through a common ancestor that's not easily accessible, so we don't want to deal with, you know, pushing data all the way up to a tree and down another. Um, but it's not the whole story, so uh, we have to deal with all of the, 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 the things that are not predictable, right? So any standard app is probably going to be dealing with talking to the server, APIs, um, we may have data that's coming from other sources, async sources, and those things are unpredictable. We don't know, you know, how long it's going to take for a request to complete. We don't even know if the request is going to complete. Um, you know, we have to deal with coordinating distributed systems and things like that. So this is where, you know, we get into um, side effects. So this is all of those outside things that, um, you know, that we can't control deterministically. And um, so we're, we're talking about uh, NGRX specifically, so I call this effects. Um, but if you're familiar with Redux in general, um, this would be like middleware and, and some other implementations, depending on, on the, uh, the implementation, the, the term might be different, but Essentially, it's the same thing. Um, we have something, we need something to deal with these outside um, concerns. So NGRX has a module called effects, and uh, we're going to look at that, uh, look at some code and talk about how that uh, module works. So at a high level, <clears throat> an effect is something that uh, can dispatch actions. So it can listen to um, <clears throat> the actions that are being dispatched and then do something about it. Uh, so it could 
um, it may dispatch another action or another series of actions. Um, what this looks like in code is we actually have a module that we import from uh, NGRX and uh, it includes a, a decorator. So basically we create a class, um, we can inject Angular services, um, we can inject this actions observable, and that's what we're going to use to, to listen to, to all of the actions that are being dispatched. Um, so uh, this class exposes um, instance properties that are decorated with the effect decorator that comes from the library. Um, we'll then pass this module and register it in our system so that NGRX knows to um, you know, call these properties every time an action is dispatched. So we can listen to, we can take that observable of actions and listen for actions of a specific type. So whatever this particular effect is interested in, um, you know, we can, we can transform the observable and uh, to deal with only those action types. So in this example, uh, this came from the, the NGRX uh, documentation. We're listening to, uh, listening for login actions. And then we're going to transform that action to pull the payload off, uh, convert it to a JSON string. And then within the switch map, um, we return a new observable uh, that comes back from the Angular and CTP service. So this is making a post uh, to the off endpoint with the, the payload uh, that was dispatched with the action. And then if that's successful, we'll map that response. And um, this is kind of a key piece here. Uh, what, what's being returned is actually another action. So logging in is you know, an asynchronous process that is composed of multiple actions. So the initial login action would initiate um, you know, this process, at which time uh, you know, when, the, when that particular uh, reducer function handles this action type, we can set a property on the state that's, you know, uh, indicating that we're processing the login. So the UI can, can select that part of the state and do with it what it needs to do. We want to show a progress indicator or a message, or whatever, you know, is appropriate for our application. We'll do that. Uh, the next, um, you know, we'll process this async request, and then once that completes, it's either going to be successful, uh, meaning that the user was authenticated, or something went wrong. Either the request failed, or their credentials were invalid. Um, so that's the alternate case here in this catch block, where we return an observable uh, that indicates that uh, or dispatches a, a failure action for this particular series of, of actions. Um, so either of those cases, um, the, the reducer will be able to handle updating the state for those two scenarios. <clears throat> and we'll look at, um, we're going to look at some examples of, of how this works. So uh, this is the this is the definition for the side effects. Um, we can add as many of these effect process, uh, properties as we need to. Uh, and then once that's created, we need to bring in the uh, that class that we just created, and we're going to pass that to the effects module. <coughs> so this is registering this with the uh, NGRX effects, so that um, you know, those will be run in the dispatch cycle. Uh, there is a kind of a, a side note. There's a new version of NGRX that's coming out. Um, tentatively should be released July 1st. Uh, you can use the night builds now. That's fairly stable. Uh, this will change slightly in terms of how these things get registered, but essentially the same um, process.
Okay, let's look at some examples. So I have a um, this sort of contrived app that we're starting to put together. There's not a lot here yet, but it's essentially just a an application that would um, provides information about things to do, events. So if you're looking for you know the weekend's coming up and you want to uh, find something to do, it's cheap or free. Uh, the idea is we build this out is to be um, you know, provide that kind of information. So um, starting to build this using Firebase as our um, back end. Um, we chose that just because it's it's fairly easy to get up and running and it's um, it's convenient for uh, building something out pretty quickly. Uh, provides authentication, real-time database, and things like that. Uh, so this doesn't do a whole lot right now, um, but we can go in and should be able to create some new event and save this. And then if we go, if we actually go into Firebase, we can see that that new event was created. Um, we've also got some capabilities around authentication. So I can sign out, sign in. And then, you know, view some, some profile information. So if I want to update this kind of thing, it will save my information. So I should be able to see that, that that got updated. Maybe. So we'll look at, um, you know, how we've started to structure this app. So this is something, you know, for us as a company, we're starting to see more and more interest in, in using Redux to manage application state. Um, you know, for us, it, uh, it simplifies our implementation for larger, more scalable apps. Um, you know, the trade-off is that we're adding a layer of abstraction because we're separating out the, basically, how things work from how they look. Um, part of that is starting to figure out how we even lay out an application. So for this particular example, um, we've, we've created a, a couple of modules. So we have a um, we have some async lazy loaded modules. These are basically various parts of the app. So if we go in here. <clears throat> You know, we've got the user area, we've got an admin, <clears throat> potentially an admin screen, if we've got people that need to control the app. Oh uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, maybe. Is that better? Cool. So on the left here is the app, on the right here, if you haven't seen this, this is the, um, the Redux dev tools. We're actually looking at, we can see the actions as they happen. Uh, so anyway, we have a bunch of, we have several uh, lazy loaded modules. These are the various parts of our app. Uh, we have this components module, which is basically just, um, we're just bringing in the material design components that we use. <coughs> Jesse keeps making hand motions at me. It's like jazz hands over there. Uh, so, Material um, exposes all of their um, pieces as modules, so we can bring in the pieces that we need. We just bring those into this components module and re-export them. This would also be where we would keep any of our sort of generic cross-application components, so you know, basic form controls, progress indicators, those kinds of things that we use through the app. Uh, we have a core module, which is things that, uh, this, this is our module that is only imported once, uh, it contains all of the global app-wide types of features. And then uh, we've got the state module, which is really the, the piece that we're interested in. So 
uh, you know, one of the things, if you look at the, the NGRX example app, um, it's kind of laid out in the, that functional style that we've seen in the past, where you take all the pieces, say all your um, reducers and have a directory for them, and all of your actions are in a directory and so forth. And, you know, we found in the past that uh, that, that doesn't scale very well. So we like to kind of stay with the um, with the feature based organization, which is also if you've been using the CLI, you know, it's kind of their best practice now. Uh, so what we've done is is we've created a single module for the state, but within that module, we're we're generally organizing our pieces into um, into feature based. Uh, directories within there. So all of the event state, any Firebase state, the form state, within within each of these, you know, we've got the options, the reducer, selectors, states, etc. Um, so uh, that also includes the effects. And then we we take all of those things and kind of roll them up uh, in the in the module and then we expose uh, just the static for root. Uh, method that we can that we can call in the um, in the application module. So that's how we register our, our state module. And uh, generally, we found that to work pretty well. One of the uh, the new features in the next release of NGRX is this idea about fractal state, um, which actually which enables um, registering state uh, per feature. So you could take these pieces um, and move them into feature modules. So if we wanted to keep you know, the, our state and actions and things in our um, in these particular you know, lazy load modules, um, we could do that as well. So that's coming. Um, we, haven't had, we haven't looked at that yet, but um, potentially that will be a, another way of enforcing sort of this feature-based organization so that we can manage our app as it scales and the state pieces. Uh, so that will, would apply uh, to effects as well. So uh, let's look uh, let's look at authentication to begin. So we have uh, so we're using Firebase, and there is a <clears throat> there are libraries for um, for Angular uh, called Angular Fire. So we're using that uh, module for all of the Angular pieces. Uh, so it gives us a set of services, things that we can inject into our own services um, to interface with the, the Firebase API. So uh, we have a set of effects to deal with um, kind of all the user concerns, which includes logging in and logging out. Um, so this is a, you know, an async process, and we need to handle all of the steps in this process so that we can transition our UI in between those states. Um, so we've, <coughs> we've created a, a login effect similar to the, to the example that we looked at. Um, we're going to filter out the um, the actions, the, the login actions, so that we're dealing just with that particular action. And then uh, we're using uh, Angular Fire, the Angular Fire auth service to provide all of the sign in functionality. So when I hit that button, it launched the new tab and took me to the Google page to select my account, all of that is being managed uh, through Firebase. And uh, if that's successful, I'll get I'll get the user back, and um, and then I can uh, dispatch another action for for success. So in this case, I'm going to um, take the payload um, from the Firebase uh, user and pass that into the login success action. So let's take a look at the, the reducer for those actions. Um, I don't have a 
reducer in this case for for login. We're really just using the login action to dispatch. Um, we set our initial state so that initial heist is false. And then we can use that to determine you know, what we need to display until we have completed the auth process. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the app, um, we can actually go back, let's see. GMACD. <laughs> So I can go back in time and look at um, what was happening before that process completed. So when we initialize our state, so I have a state property, top level uh, root property for all of the user state, and that's what this is. Uh, let's see. So <clears throat> before I've logged in, initialize is false is authenticated is false. So I know at this point in time what my UI should look like based on this state. And so we're just rendering a spinner. Um, we could do some other things if we wanted to prevent the user from doing certain things. Um, it really depends on what the user experience is. Uh, once that happens and the login process is successful, then I have now um, uh, I have uh, these properties are now set to true, so we know that the user is authenticated, we know that the auth system is, or the auth state has been initialized, um, and I also have the profile information that's got all the things I need to render um, my user profile. So we're looking at you know, the display name, email, the avatar, image, URL. So all those things that, that are being rendered in this view. Um, and then I could do, uh, in our example, we don't have a, we don't have a handler right now for, for failure, but I could do something in that case as well and you know, tell the user whatever they need to know about what they should do next in the case that uh, authentication failed. Uh, so, so we do that, um, and then we have similar implementations for logging out, and uh, we're also using another NGRX um, module to handle logout success. So in this case, when we dispatch, um, we're, we're dispatching an action that comes from the NGRX router store. So this module, um, takes the, the Angular router state and makes that available on our state object. So you may have noticed that within our, um, within our state we have a router property and that will contain you know, the current path depending on where we've gone. Uh, those, all of that is being handled by the NGRX router store module. That also provides um, um, actions for changing the router state. So we can simply dispatch an action to say, you know, go to the route after we log out. Um, those take the same sort of parameters that the native Angular router would take. Um, so again, you know, we're we're changing our state through Redux actions instead of typically grabbing these things and, and um, you know, doing them through the services directly. And what that allows us, or what that does for us, is it gives us that transactional history so we can see exactly how things changed as the user interacted with our app. Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned, I mentioned before that uh, another benefit of, of this is that we can take this object and serialize it and save it off. So if something went wrong, we could send this in an error report and things like that and be able uh, to restore that state uh, like on a local de uh, dev machine. That's very handy. Uh, let's see. So the next piece uh, I think we want to talk a little bit about um, 
dealing with forms and user input and things like that. Uh, so we have uh, two forms that I showed. One is this uh, profile form, and the other is this uh, event uh, creation form. <clears throat> And uh, we implemented these in two slightly different ways to test out some different uh, ways of using forms. Um, there's, there's no, so there's a lot, uh, several different ways to do this, and it really depends on kind of what your user experience is. So we have a slightly different experience between these two views. In this view, you know, the user types in something and then presses enter or hits the, the save button. And that actually, uh, on, on that um, interaction, uh, persists the data to Firebase. So we saw uh, these events get dispatched that include the, um, that data that we're sending uh, to the server. In the other case, we've got sort of a more of a live form. So in this case, if I make a change, it's going to save that as soon as I make that change. So I can you know, fix this spelling error or whatever. We've got some contrived uh, validation. Um, so we're going to look at kind of the two different ways that, that we've been implemented in so far. So looking at the uh, the first view again, <clears throat> so for this one we have a uh, we have our events uh, module that's lazy loaded. We have a couple uh, of components in there. We've got our standard routing module, and we've got an events page. So this would be our sort of top level component. Uh, it's our, it's not very smart. But this is potentially where we could wire up additional state uh, concerns if we had them. Well, I guess, I'm sorry, this is the list, um, which we don't, we don't have anything in that, um, in that view at the moment. <clears throat> uh, the create event page is the, the top level component for that, for this view. So this is our smart component, container component. Um, and it doesn't do a whole lot, but if we look at its uh, template, basically we have a single element in here. And this is the uh, this is our form. That uh, form component is is dumb. So this thing does not know about application state. It's simply a vehicle to collect data from the user. And if we wanted to put the, uh, data back into that form, it would handle that as well. So we we implemented this one using the um, reactive forms which uses a model approach, so we've defined just a super simple model. It's just the name at this point. Uh, and then that is the, the thing that, that holds our data. We've also got some, you know, we're just using the standard Angular um, validators uh, for that field, so it's a, you know, it's required if I don't, if I try to save that, it won't. I won't enable that button until I type something in there. <clears throat> uh, so that's all just pure, pure Angular business at this point. There's not too much in terms of the template. Again, it's just some material design components. Um, when the the form is submitted, we simply emit that event back up into the parent uh, uh, component. So our create event page composes that that dumb form component. And um, we listen for the, the uh, create event event. And when that happens, we're, we're dispatching a new action. So 
uh, in our event actions, we have a create event action. So this is the thing that initiates that asynchronous process. Um, you know, in this, we have haven't built out much here, but we could, uh, at this point, you know, display a spinner, disable this form, whatever we want to do to let the user know that something's happening. And then once that completes, we probably go to another view or show the newly created event and so forth, give them a way to edit it, uh, et cetera. So we haven't built any of that yet, but um, it's a good start. So. When this happens, uh, we have a, a series of effects for events. And we also have some general just Firebase uh, actions as well. Um, so we could potentially call these directly. Uh, in this case, um, we're actually using um, those Firebase actions within uh, the event effect. So Again, I think it's pretty fairly straightforward. Uh, we're just listening for that create event. And then we map the uh, payload. So there's a, just a helper that comes from the effects library that will uh, uh, take the payload off of the action. So it's essentially the same as doing you know, something like uh, maybe to do. Well, I'll have to type all that business. And then again, we, um, uh, we're mapping to a new action. So in this case, um, in, you know, in Firebase terminology, we have a list. So the events are a list of, of documents, essentially. And we want to push a new item onto that list. Uh, the push method will generate an ID for us and persist that data in, in our real-time database. So, you know, if we were to look at the Firebase um, effects, we're handling, we're actually handling that as an effect as well. So again, it's another, this is an asynchronous process. Um, we could also have, we could also have a service that kind of wraps these concerns if we wanted to, if we needed to further abstract that. It may not be necessary, um, but that could wrap the, the um, Firebase actions as well. So um, again, we're dealing, you know, this is all very generic to how Firebase works. So we could push any list item on there. Um, you know, it's a pretty basic implementation, but uh, this is something that if we were to build it out, it would be reusable in any sort of Redux app that, that uses Firebase. <clears throat> so the sort of the net effect is that um, we're <clears throat> we're able to uh, you know manage our UI in a very synchronous way. We know how the what should happen in terms of the visual display and then deal with all of the, the business of um, you know, persistent data and things like that through our artifacts. Um, one thing that we could do, or one thing that this enables is we could potentially, for development, stub these things out so that we don't actually have to have these services. Um, we could build mock effects and register them in, say, a, a test mode uh, so that we could run these things without actually having to have a server, for example. Uh, one thing I didn't cover, or one thing I didn't do is uh, write any tests for these. Uh, you should write tests for your effects. Um, NGRX provides some test helpers to set all of these things up. So if you've used the Angular test bed and things like that, uh, they work in a similar way. So you can set up effects to run in a test, in a unit test environment in sort of a very synchronous way, um, but still verify that they're doing the things that we expect them to do. So we can inject our, you know, our mock um, 
if we're injecting things into the constructor, we can stub those out and mock them and so forth. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff we've covered. Are there questions so far? So you, 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 you're, somebody has told you about the library and all this stuff. So, um, how do you, how would you go about modeling the, you know, most of the back end is just, you know, very slow. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> you, you write your code so that you say, okay, put on comics. I let it go rip for a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, I do a couple of things. Other things. Right. So um, that's a good question. Um, I deal with a lot of that. Yeah. So you want to deal with coordinating, um, you know, canceling, essentially. Kind. Of, right. You either have done something. Of work in the bag takes minutes. Mm -hmm. I allow the user to do the other stuff. Then yeah, we don't want to show it's a, it completes later. We don't want to show that. And then they change their mind and come back and say, Oh, oh I don't want this event and I want that other event. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, you know, there's probably a couple of different ways that we can handle that. Um, you know, keeping track of, say, like transaction IDs and knowing, be, being able to say, dispatch an action that would effectively cancel that thing so that when it comes back, you know, we don't care what happens once it completes, but we once the reducer hits it, we could see that, oh yeah, the user caused something in the UI to change the state. Yeah, exactly. And then, so when that reducer hits, it will know, or when, you know, when we go through that the reduction cycle, we'd be able to just ignore that data that, that came back in. And that reduction cycle, Users in the UI coming back and changing it. So the ones in the team before, let's say, one of the three things, they were smart enough to say, hey, you have done three and two, this is cool, they could do, you can get to the user just past it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think so. So it's, you know, it's, um, it's <coughs> hard to talk about in the abstract, but the, um, I think that's why you behind it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, again, there's there's a couple ways to handle that. Part of it depends on kind of, you know, the how you model your state really depends on what you're trying to display to the user, what you want them to actually see. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, certainly we can Not handle that. Not per se, but sometimes it's just kind of like what they're trying to do that gets it eventually to reflect the final thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, the, u the users are the users are are unpredictable. But what we do with the, <coughs> with the UI is very predictable. And, and then for Redux, right, because we control that, um, and then whatever we need to do with those sort of async processes, if we need to ignore those things, we can do that, we can handle that in the, uh, 
you know, with how we model the observables and how we build the effects and so forth. If we want to communicate to the user that something happened, then we need to model that in state and have those things reflected in the state. Um, uh, you know, the idea is we can sort of deal with those two concerns separately. So we can think about how what the UI should look like and how it should behave without having to necessarily even know how it's going to happen on the back end. Because we can take all that out. We know what our state is. Um, our UI is essentially just a function of giving in an object and, and rendering it from one point in time to the next. Anyway, um, let's, uh, let's look at the other form. So we were, we were playing around with this idea of storing um, form state in the um, in our application state. So this was an idea that, that we saw at um, NGCon and kind of wanted to look, investigate it a little more to see if it might make it easier to, to scale forms. So uh, we have a, uh, a form root property in the, uh, in the application state. So all it holds is a an object hash of entities. So the key is basically an identifier for the form, and then we can store our essentially our form model as the, the value for for that particular form. Um, potentially this gives us the ability to um, you know make that state accessible to other parts of the app if we need it. Um, not sure in this sort of trivial example or you know early example that, that that makes a lot of sense um but it's there and we're trying it out so um we have a couple actions we need to be able to to essentially fetch the form uh, model and then we want to be able to to save the form as well so in our in our um, reducers we're uh, we're taking the the payload for that for the save form action is uh, the key, which is our the, more or less the name of our form, and then uh, we merge the the payload uh, the value in, into the state object. <clears throat> um, we also have a selector which simply returns the. Uh, where we've created a selector for our particular form in question. So the profile form is what's holding all of our uh, all of our data in this other view. So we have a you know, gender and a birthday bio. So we should be able to if I save this. Should be able to see that the dispatch in action um, with the user profile key and then our form values. So these are the things that this is what we're going to be persisting in our backend store. Uh, and then some effects. Um, let's see. So we also have the all of the pieces to deal with this. Um, snack bar, which is that little thing that pops up at the bottom of the time that we make a change. Again, that's very generic. Um, the app component listens to, to that state and handles, uh, you know, showing that thing depending on what messages are in the queue. And then we can pop those. So we see those actions as well. And then those things. You know, disappears after half a second or so. Sure. That's a good question. So there's a way to merge effects. Um, so generally speaking, individual effects I think would dispatch a single action, but. Um, I think it is possible to do something like that. 
normally it's it's not necessary, but I think there might be cases where it really does. I mean, it's this well notification thing. Yeah. Um, Right. Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of cases where it's been necessary. Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, there, uh, we can have effects that don't dispatch any action at all. So they may just do something um, if there's some sort of coordination that occurs. So they can still respond to actions, but they may not necessarily be creating new actions. Um, so you may be able to say, uh, handle it that way. Um, so the uh, so we're saving this this form data, and we have a you know dependent service uh, that we're using to to save the profile. Um, and so all of our in this case all of our our form data is, is in our state. <clears throat> um, so let's slide. So essentially, what we're doing is we're using, in this case, we're using just the regular standard um, form templates. So we're, within the form itself, um, we're using two way data binding. Uh, so we have a, we have our model, and then we have an ng form object that is uh, changing as the user is changing the inputs in the form. So we can respond to those changes and dispatch the save form action, which is what our uh, smart component is doing. The user is reactive. It's not the reactive. It's template building. So in this case, so our, our reactive form, you know, we're passing in a model, and we would, you know, if we want to change the form input, or if we want to, um, you know, uh, we don't, we're not doing anything in terms of 280 data mining. We're using the validated, uh, standard validation, but nothing actually happens until you press that save button. In this case, um, we're actually watching the, um, so that's in our, uh, in our user module, we have this profile form. We've made the profile form a smart component. So we're injecting the, uh, the store here. So it will listen to, or it can select that state, that form state, um, which is how we get that data in initially. So if I go back to, you know, I navigate away, and I go back to the profile, I'm seeing you know, I've, I've, we fetch that form data. We have it in a, um, we have it in the state. Um, if it was already there, we don't need to go to Firebase to get it. It can just be, you know, we don't have to do anything in that case. It's already in the, in our state object. Um, but then once the user starts interacting with that form, we're, we're listening to the value changes on the ng form object. So. In the in the template, you know we've got a we've got a reference to. Uh, we're passing up that form control and making it available in the component, and then uh, these inputs or form controls are tied to uh, the model properties. So all of those things uh, that we need to persist. When those values change um, after a second, so we debounce. We don't save until you've paused for a second, um, but we listen to those changes, and if the, if the form's, you know, been touched, then, and it's not invalid, then we'll actually, then we'll uh, dispatch, um, so we push our, uh, we, we, uh, we may actually do that. Oh, sorry. So this is for the invalid. Uh, so if it's invalid, then we um, show that snack bar to say we're not able to save the save the thing, um, and then we just dispatch the the save form action. 
Uh, and that's pretty much it for the for what that component does. So it's a slightly different use case. Um, we played around with the in the in the ngconf uh, talk that uh, they were actually doing the validation in here as well. But it turns out um, there were some some issues with that. Part of that was related to kind of how um, material design works, the, the components. So um, I wasn't, uh, it didn't seem like a good idea. Do you have like standard format? Yeah, so doing, doing validation essentially at the selector level, so that we can say, you know, based on, on that form state, do the validation at that time. Um, so again, selectors are essentially like database queries, right? We can query our, our database, which is our, our store, right? And compute data, um, make transformations, things like that. So for example, I think uh, in this case, yeah, so so and the reason we'd want to do that is you know those are small composable pieces, so we can test those things. We can um, you know take those little bits and compose them into some other, yeah, exactly, bigger bits. Um, and we're, you know, we're using reselect for that, but uh, I think that's being built more concretely into like VRX. Yeah. Yeah, so I know Yeah. I definitely should not be mutating it. <laughs> and if I am, then ignore that because that, yeah. that's bad. We don't want to do that. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's a good question. I wonder if I am. Uh, so the um, so, so one solution we've come up with for another project is that uh, we use a DOM DOM component. You know, so whenever we pass it in, we're actually creating a copy inside of that component. It's part of the thing the process. It's actually a full gallery, and you'll actually copy inside of that code. Then you decouple it in the store, and the store can't be modified by binary. So you have to modify it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, when it comes to mutable, one of those is not really good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, I wonder if um, if Solak is doing that for me too. But, um, but it's a good point about using the store freeze. Like, I would uh, I would recommend doing that pretty much just as a standard practice. And I can't remember now. Let's see. Typically, I think we set that up um, when we uh, set up our root reducer. So we are using store freeze. So in a development environment, when we um, produce or set up that root um, reducer, we would set up a store freeze. And then in the production environment, uh, we take that out. But that is, uh, at this point, I still think that's the best way to, to catch those kinds of things. Um, I would certainly do that as a, as a standard practice. I think reselect may actually be based on the data from that reserve. Sure. In any case, um, don't mutate your state.
and do it. Uh, yeah, so this technique, you know, we've um, we've been playing around with it. I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that it's a great way to do it. Um, but again, two-way data binding is still a fairly good solution for those real-time form interactions. So being able to, if, you're, if you have a user experience where you want to be reacting right away to changes instead of waiting for a, an explicit action, um, I think that still works pretty well. So that's, uh, that's what I have for the presentation. We, uh, we do this every day, so if you, uh, if you have questions for us, you know, if you think of something that, um, that we didn't cover here tonight, again, feel free to, um, you can reach out to me. Uh, I'm on GitHub, Denver Dev, Slack, um, email, first name, last name, at debug.com. And uh, if you want, you know, want to talk any uh, in detail about some of these things afterwards, I can I'll be available as well.